I would like to start the evening uh, by showing um, a show I made for Pact in Amsterdam, which is a small non-profit or like a mid-size non-profit in the eastern part of Amsterdam. And they, yeah, they have a very good program, I think. And they were so gracious as to invite me to make a show there. And um, I think this is, I um, like to start with this show because I think uh, it's one of these rare, rare occasions where all of the anecdotes I use uh, click into one um, hole, where it feels complete. And um, the show was called Little Cherry Virus. I, um, I was reading the newspaper in Limburg, um, at Belang van Limburg, and um, uh, it was making a report on a uh, uh, fruit disease, which is infesting all of the cherry uh, plantations in uh, Limburg. And um, uh, it's interesting to know, maybe, that in Limburg, um, uh, it, the south part of this province is uh, relying on tourism because of the beautiful blossom of the trees. Of course, the fruit, uh, the crops that grow and uh, are sold all over the world, uh, even until China. Uh, and um, voila. Uh, so um, I usually, uh, so <laughs> I usually, um, for every show, I make a series of small paintings, uh, which are like small didactic panels, which explain all of the aspects um, of the show, um, of um, the pieces I'm going to show. Um, they, they try to be all encompassing. And I try to put all of the information, all, all of the context, um, all of the side notes, and all of my motivations uh, to take aesthetic as well as conceptual decisions, I try to squeeze into small panels. Uh, because, um, and, um, because I was always relying on the mediation, uh, which you always make in collaboration with um, uh, curators or writers, and you always lose some kind of the, um, uh, the feeling or the... the um, um, uh, some of the the pit, the the um, the finger spitzen gefühl <laughs> of uh, some of the anecdotes, um, and so little cherry virus is basically a, a virus that infects um, cherry trees, and because of this virus, all of the the cherries stay small and become bitter over the years, and every year they get smaller and smaller, and this is creating lots of problems because of the only treatment you can uh, give uh, the orchards is by uh, cutting away. Uh, cutting off all of this, um, the trees and uh, gradually replacing them in blocks so they don't infest one, uh, one another. And this creates lots of problems. Um, um, the, uh, um, all of a sudden, um, uh, people working for the um, uh, Department of um, uh, Economy uh, and the Department of Nature, the historical department of the city, uh, the farmers all have to work together because the historical high stem orchards have to be replaced and the farmers would love to replace them with low stem, more um, um, uh, fruit bearing crops and uh, this would uh, ruin the tourism. You will have different kind of uh, landscape experiences. The landscape hasn't changed uh, since um, the Middle Ages. And um, so it's an interesting question where biology and uh, culture meet and where people you don't expect to come together uh, convene in order to try and uh, define what the identity of, a, of an area actually is. Another interesting aspect of it, I thought, was that um, the um, the disease is probably introduced by a um, by uh, the sale or the planting of Japanese cherry uh, cherry blossom trees, and because of our interest in a foreign culture, because of um, our fascination uh, for Japanese aesthetics in the 30s, uh, we create um, a problem that forces us to. Uh, rethink what the identity and what the focus should be of a certain area. Should you, uh, what is most important? Is it like to make money with the cherries? Is it more important that there's tourism? Is it more important that the landscape is preserved? So a compromise has to be formed and everybody has to um, give their opinion. And I think it's a very interesting situation. So for every show, I make these small panels. So you see the installation shot. 
And um, so I started off by um, uh, making these uh, paintings. I found a um, um, few reports about the uh, pytho, uh, pathological appearances in the cellular structures of the disease. So when you cut through um, uh, plant material, you find uh, several shapes popping up, octagonals, uh, um, and then these uh, protuberances, um, several shapes which I tried to make into a logo, which you can see later on. Um, then the only remedy is, of course, um, uh, like, the, uh, like one of the aspects is that this, the closer you put decorative cherries, um, you see, as you see the, the, the gray part, which has, like a dis uh, like of course, an, a Japanese influence, um, if you put them too close uh, uh, to uh, cherries to eat, um, there's a higher risk of infection, and the further apart, the smaller the risk uh, gets. And as you can see in the middle, there's a depiction of the apple mealy bug, who is the culprit. It's a small bug, um, and it uh, uh, transmits the disease uh, through the air. The female bugs <laughs> get wings and fly away and get drifted away with the, the wind, so it's the, the women have done it, um, which I thought was quite, <laughs> quite an interesting idea and a bit problematic, but um, um, voila, that's the apple mealy bug. <laughs> Um, which is the culprit. Then is the blocks, uh, like blocks square as a cup. So in, uh, in you divide the orchards in quarters, replace them, and uh, after a while, uh, replace them with new plants. Um, and that's like, you know, the topic, which plants will later replace them. I thought it's an interesting topic. So uh, uh, you have all these aspects coming together, you know, like uh, um, uh, culture and uh, ecology, um, history, um, the future, uh, you know, transport, you know, everything uh, comes together. Uh, and I th so I thought like, yeah, how I want to make sculptures with this infected wood. It's very hard to obtain the wood um, because it's infected, it has to be destroyed. Um, so transport is actually forbidden. But hey, I'm an artist. Um, so, um, um, uh, what the, elaborate on that later but um, at, at first I was thinking like what kind of a shape should I deal with you know like which shape is uh, is apt which uh, shape is representing this kind of uh, sensitivity you know like the sensitivity for, for um, like uh, like uh, it, which binds together ecology and politics nearly um, and then um, I found by accident um, uh, an anecdote about the the Penn Treaty so when William Penn uh, settler moved into Pennsylvania. Uh, that's why it's called Pennsylvania. Um, he was um, he left um, England and got a permit from the King of England, uh, George the um, Fourth, I think, um, uh, to you know um, get a piece of land. And um, so he went with his bill of rights to not of rights, but with his bill to uh, to the states. And in Pennsylvania, he made a treaty underneath an elm tree. That's why it's called the Elm Tree Treaty. They did it in Shackamaxon. They also called the Shackamaxon Treaty uh, with the Lenape Turtle Clan. So the Lenape is a tribe of Native Americans and it's the same clan that was chased out of Manhattan and was then uh, squeezed into Pennsylvania and Delaware and uh, like a broader area. Um, and so they made a treaty which was quite progressive. Uh, so it basically uh, came down to an agreement of uh, living together like next to one another uh, using the crops of the land hunting trading these kind of uh, very uh, basic agreements because it's a very barren land you know um, it's also so i thought it was uh, very interesting of course it was violated uh, by the sons of william penn already who um, unlawfully started selling off land to to the dutch and the Swedes, <laughs> and uh, you know, all the rest is history, of course. But I thought there's a similar kind of sensitivity where you have, you know, uh, the, the, the natives and then the foreign culture mingling in. And it's just, you know, migration will cause, you know, circumstances. And uh, I think it's an interesting topic. And so they made this tree underneath the tree. And um, this tree, which, which was the big elm, uh, was quite important in the, in the, um, the history of uh, America. Um, and uh, also, uh, it's, um, I think it's interesting that this kind of, uh, this way of dealing with the relic, like a non-Catholic way of dealing with it, because, you know, um, 
uh, William Penn was a Quaker, so uh, he left for uh, religious reasons. Uh, out of England, of course, he was like it's more of a Protestant, and they don't really like relics and these kind of things. Um, but basically, um, they revert, revert this tree because of um, the uh, Native Americans who don't make written documents but make objects. Re um, or like uh, use objects to remember agreements rather than contracts or writing it down. So they use, there is a wampum belt, which is a belt made out of uh, shells, and there was the tree. And this tree was struck by lightning in the 19th century. And um, of course there were lots of um, uh, uh, people uh, interested in this wood which represents so much uh, uh, history. And, um, and so they, um, they used the tree to make lots of, uh, you know, relics and knickknacks. So um, the few objects surviving in the Penn Treaty Museum in Shackamaxon <laughs> are um, eight boxes and two chairs. And I just found an image of one chair, which is this one. As you can see, it comes back into in the, in the, in the, the painting. And then there were eight boxes which I also, so I thought like, oh, it's easy. I, the sculptures I will have to make are eight boxes and two chairs. But then of course, uh, I don't have enough uh, cherry wood um, to make this. Um, so I went to, on a quest to find infected um, cherry tree wood, and um, which was very hard to do. So I called all of the auctions, the fruit auctions uh, for firewood, but they said like, yeah, I mean, it's burnt immediately on the farm. We can't transport it. It's very problematic. And um, eventually I was going to a, f um, a regular plant store and they were selling infected trees to plant in your garden. Like by then I realized they have this uh, very specific pattern, like a very specific purple patterning in the leaves, um, which is one of the first uh, things in, which happens. And they sell like young saplings to plant in your garden to infect all of Belgium if you, <laughs> if you want. You know, it's like, you know, it's Belgium. There's no policy. Um, so, um, I went there with my sister who's got a small uh, car and um, we bought eight trees and broke them into pieces in the parking lot, uh, which was quite a beautiful scene, I thought, and you know, people thought we were crazy. And then uh, we took these uh, relics home and uh, since they were saplings and so small, I couldn't use them to make massive um, um, boxes, eight boxes and two chairs. I, I just uh, used them as dowels, you know, uh, tuppen. Um, so, um, and this also has um, its um, reason. I was watching this very interesting um, British um, um, reality show where um, some Cockney kids from London are forced to live with um, um, uh, shakers um, in a different state. I forgot the name of the state, to be honest. I'm very sorry. But anyway, um, uh, what the uh, shakers basically do is live uh, without, with um, like a minimal amount of electricity and, you know, progressive goods. Um, they want to live a very uh, simple life. And uh, also they're a very, you know, uh, quite a radical Protestant um, side party. Or like, uh, um, and also they have a very problematic relationship to the relic and these kind of things. But then I saw in this documentary, uh, in this reality show, it's not a documentary, it's a reality show, it's real telly. Um, they, um, they were raising a barn and basically it's like, a, like building a big uh, hut or like a big, uh, you know, uh, um, building to uh, put hay or a stable or these kind of things. And um, it was built by the Miller family and all of the girls in the family were allowed to write their names on the dowels which were going into the, the building. And I thought this was such a con like a contradiction, you know, like it's very interesting. I think then there uh, maybe, uh, you know, the family or the women in the family hold the family together. There's some kind of symbolism there, but at the same time, it's also just fun and superficial. And it's more of a like I, I always think it's a more of a Catholic thing to do rather than a um, Protestant thing. But then maybe also it's um, it's part of this tradition of uh, the Chakamaxon Treaty uh, elm. Uh, which is also used in the same way. So there's an interesting uh, tradition developing there. So I didn't feel really awkward about using just um, the dowels. And then another part, uh, I thought also, like when you talk about the dowels and you talk about the links within the family, also the, you mustn't forget that um, uh, like 
America wasn't densely populated whatsoever, and uh, that uh, uh, William Penn was the head of the Penn clan, and um, the Len Lenape Turtle clan is also kind, kind of, um, you know, a clan, a family. So basically it was a, an agreement between two families. So um, I thought this is interesting in, in uh, the relation of uh, politics. It's a very interesting biotope. Uh, or like an agreement, I, I thought it uh, kind of worked. So I uh, juxtaposed um, the current logo used by the Lenape Turtle Clan. A nice side story. Um, um, they are called the Turtle Clan sin because they have in Delaware and in Pennsylvania, they have the um, uh, broadest variety of turtles, 11 different species. Um, and therefore uh, they have uh, interesting bond with them, I suppose. And that's why it's in the logo, of course, and they, they call themselves the Turtle Clan. Um, and then to the right of it is the, the Pan, family lo uh, Pan Family Crest, also kind of a logo, which is uh, consisting of a black band with uh, three silver balls. White is representing silver in heraldry. Uh, so I really like to put these two uh, crests next to one another, and you will you'll see in a moment why. Also below it is a kind of depiction of one of the symptoms of the disease, which is curling leaves and purple patches <laughs> depicted. So this is also, it's a kind of a representation of one of these agreements. So it's a, it's, um, a turtle shell I ordered on the internet um, and it's, um, it came especially from Delaware and uh, I put three silver magnets, uh, like silver colored magnets, silver balls on top of it, um, which is kind of a, an agreement between the families as well. So the two logos are merged into one uh, ridiculous sculpture. Um, also, uh, this is the installation shot. As you can see, uh, I also made a mural based on the, um, the proximity, you know, like uh, the closer you put the trees together, the higher the risk, the further apart, the less there is risk. Quite a simple idea, and I made this into a decorative pattern on the walls. Um, I also made a podium, which in, uh, includes um, the combination of the both logos, so three balls, uh, then this um, kind of colored um, circle behind the, the crest of the Lenape clan, and um, the logo I designed for the, um, for the disease. Voila, three balls with the blue, which is like the pen. You can see it. Here's another one. <laughs> this is the installation for the for the paintings. Didn't feel like showing them on the wall this time. <laughs> then they look more uh, like utensils. They're always 21 and 28 centimeters. Um, it's a little smaller than an A4. It's very practical. I like that it's got a link to an A4, uh, also because it attempts to replace a um, text. And also, um, you can pick it up and take it under your arm and take it anywhere you're taking along the content of your show, and it is a show on itself. Um, and also it's 21 on 28, so it can fit on the scanner. And um, I don't have to pay anyone to reproduce them with a proper photo. As you, that's why you have all these uh, nasty scans in the, in the slideshow. These are the two chairs. Um, funny enough, uh, later I saw that they were made in Indonesia after I purchased them. <laughs> Another nice link to, um, to Dutch colonial history. But that's for another time. <laughs> but I replaced all of the um, dowels, as you can see. It was uh, brought, uh, put together with dowels, and then I replaced them. Uh, that's the, you can see the tiny dots, and the, the lighter colored uh, pieces are infected uh, cherry wood. These are uh, the eight boxes. I thought, yeah, since um, I'm not going to open these boxes, I, I designed a way of. Um, uh, um, I could make boxes out of planks with this way of uh, placing the dowels, um, but in the end it wasn't necessary, so I just had uh, massive oak blocks, which is a very canonical wood, I think, in uh, the West. So that's how it turned out, as one block. This is a snapping turtle shell. <laughs> I really like snapping turtles, they're beautiful. And they have, uh, it has uh, three uh, tiny uh, balls on top of it. I now replace them with the bigger ones, it's better. <laughs> another installation view. No. And another one. 
also what I like is, you know, if you place it like this, um, they really look like utensils, I think. And uh, you can see that it's uh, rather about performing the show than really depicting it and being uh, wholesome. You can, you can um, kind of guess what it's about and can feel, uh, um, you know, in the, it's a more hazy way of depicting the content of the show, I think. And also I like the, um, uh, the idea of a podium and I invited a friend of mine to do a performance on top of it, which didn't happen because she got sick. <laughs> <laughs> voilà, that's the first uh, slideshow I wanted to show you. Then, this one. So this, I um, like to start with the, the first show because um, I think all of the anecdotes have a kind of uh, connection with one another and complete one another. Um, and this is the Witter the Witch show um, I did. Uh, I was invited, and this is the show where Moritz has seen. Uh, it was a show I was invited to make um, on, uh, for Witter the Wit. Um, uh, for the, on the on their 25th anniversary, so this year they were existing for 25 years, uh, or last year actually, and uh, they invited several artists um, to uh, reflect on their history, and uh, so I made a reinterpretation of their history, uh, a reflection on it, and um, also they encouraged you to um, invite, or they, you know, they uh, kind of uh, did it actually, uh, to, to work with a different um, archive. So it's a very specific task, you know. Um, so I had to flick through their entire history. And um, voila. Oh, yeah. So basically, uh, we worked together with um, 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 the uh, Scandinavian Institute of Comparative Vandalism, which doesn't exist anymore. But this was a, um, a, um, a collection of images brought together by, amongst others, uh, Asger Jorn. It was an idea of Asger Jorn. And um, this is a archive that attempted to make an alternative for uh, modern art history, of, uh, like Western art history, um, or classical art history. It was um, uh, basically a collection of images that were taken in the 60s. It existed from 60 until 64. Um, um, and uh, this uh, Jorn uh, sent uh, uh, photogra photographers like um, Gerard Franceschi to take uh, photographs of um, sculptures uh, from before um, uh, the Renaissance. And um, so these uh, images uh, we were, uh, um, were showing in the space. And um, apart from this, I thought, um, I, I looked through the, the the archive, and I noticed that uh, after a certain while, certain topics become important and have been important all through, um, all through, uh, uh, you know, the the art scene. So, with the bit was founded in 1990, and um, uh, so they've been existing for 25 years, 26, and um, I noticed that several themes reoccur, uh, and I filled five themes out of them as a kind of caricature as a kind of um, um, way of um, providing uh, um, an alternative reading, a very subjective reading. So by making a summary, which is basically the classical way of working, you, um, you lose lots of the details, and that's what I don't like. I really like uh, specificity, uh, hyper-specificity, and, uh, and like more general themes can become very ambitious and, uh, and a bit silly after a while. And I don't know if this is like, um, uh, the thing I want to be working with. Um, so I thought the most interesting way of um, dealing with this was to filter out five uh, general themes. And um, <clears throat> these were migration, uh, sexuality, um, domesticity, urban development, and um, I forgot one. <laughs> Ecology or nature, <laughs> which only uh, popped up um, towards the end of their history. Um, and so um, I made these uh, five murals. We had the archive of Ascarion, and also I made um, um, the archive was also being cleaned up. For the first time, it was being uh, organized, uh, was made accessible, um, and uh, this created an opportunity. It was for much far easier to work with the archive. And um, I decided to make legend paintings, as I make for my own pieces, um, as for my, for my own uh, uh, projects. But I wanted to make legend paintings, which would be installed permanently within the archive. 
So basically I made an exception, painted on paper, and these are now permanently pasted into the new boxes of the Witte de Wit archive. So it's a permanent contribution which will um, um, influence your interpretation of a Guillaume Bell show from the 1990s, for example. I will show it later. Um, <clears throat> and apart from that, I also reinterpreted some pieces which are more related to the oral history I could find, the more subjective reinterpretations. This is like the framework, that's why you have the box here. So, this is the first piece um, uh, dealing with migration. Um, these are the columns of Hercules. On the left hand side, you have the flag of Gibraltar. On the right hand side, you know, they're stretched out. And on the right hand side, um, uh, the flag of uh, Ciota, and these are the two rocks at the Strait of Gibraltar, at the, uh, um, the outer edges of it. Um, and this is also uh, uh, related to this, um, you know, the, um, uh, the empire where the sun never sets. And the columns of Hercules were, of course, you know, like uh, used by um, uh, the pillars of Hercules, used by um, Charlemagne, uh, Charles, uh, uh, Charles V. Um, in the Renaissance, so I thought it was apt to bring these things together. Also, you know, migration logo. This is <coughs> representing uh, nature. I thought it would be nice to have it in a, in a pink color. Um, and also, um, I was, um, once you start Googling nature and fi trying to find a summary, you end up with in such a, a silly places. For example, uh, you could end up uh, Googling Mother Earth and finding ways of, uh, of uh, depicting this, you know. So Mother Earth is sometimes depicted as a labyrinth, which I also found back in the archive of uh, Oscar Jorn. So you could, uh, I thought it was interesting to find this in the Jorn archive, which has a very socialist um, uh, history, uh, but then also that is used nowadays, this kind of symbolism is used nowadays in a very esoteric uh, realm. Um, and so I, I basically, this is the, this image, this is related to sexuality. These are just um, compositions with dicks, abstracted. So this was nice. Um, this is the domesticity, uh, tablecloth design, very uh, classical, you know, the light above the table. This looks like the apartment of uh, I'm staying in tonight. It's very nice. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Kunstverein. Um, <clears throat> and this was really, this is a pattern with uh, houses related to urbanism. So there's been a big focus at Witte de Wit for, um, uh, especially at the end of the 90s, in the, in the around 2000 until 2004. Um, uh, dealing with um, uh, urban development, uh, working with architects, doing social pr uh, projects uh, in the in the surrounding uh, in surroundings of the new developed houses, and of course, you know, Rotterdam has been bombed to pieces and then rebuilt. So it's always been an, a quite an, uh, a haven of um, like a, like a, the, the Dutch capital for um, uh, innovative uh, architecture, you could say. So. One of the first murals I cut into two pieces. So I literally made on two existing columns in the space, the two pillars of Hercules. So this is the, um, the flag of uh, Ciuta, um, the Moroccan side of the Strait of Gibraltar. And uh, it's uh, stretched out and made into a principle to decorate a column. So I really like that. It, that's why the show is also called Decorations. Um, I, I thought, yeah, it is very important to make a, um, this is the other side, Gibraltar. I thought it was very important to make a show uh, dealing with a very spe specific task, with a, a very specific uh, history, and you easily end up in a, in a kind of, you know, an existing way of working in a kind of a subculture nearly. And I thought um, by making murals, you relate to a different way of making summaries, more like, uh, you know, Sonia Delaunay uh, uh, dealing with progress, uh, these very general themes um, and these kind of ambitions. And I thought it's very dubious. And also I like that it's called decorations because um, it's more folkloristic and submissive. Um, the, uh, the content is not oppressive. And uh, as you can see, it's just a nice column to look at, uh, or like, yeah, maybe you can, you can also hate it, of course, but <laughs> um, I thought it was important to also, you know, have um, uh, like uh, reproduce or reinterpret the history of, of uh, this institution in a very, um, you know, in, as an experience. So that was important, like the Disney version of the history. <laughs> um, and this is the mural related to um, nature. It's a green circle. You can you kind of roll into the space. This is a sexuality, just a pink gradient. It can be as simple as that. <laughs> um, 
and then a tablecloth, uh, which is domesticity. In the foreground, you see a sculpture. I will talk about this later. And then this is urban development. I really, uh, I wanted to make an, uh, a very specific, uh, uh, a very classicistic, pardon, uh, frieze, uh, which looks like a barrelief, but is made out of small houses. Uh, it's a very stupid way of uh, depicting it, but I think it, uh, it's, you know, it's got its own language. And um, uh, the curator could choose the color of the wall. It's randomly chosen. So if I would uh, remake it anywhere, um, I do this quite often, uh, then an anybody can choose the color. That's the part of its, um, um, uh, um, yeah, um, way of uh, keeping a link with what's contemporary. I think, I think this maybe it, maybe this color is a bit too fashionable, but that's very interesting. Then these are the inserts into the archive. These are the the new boxes. Um, and for example, on your right hand side, uh, you can see. A summary of a few of the elements of um, a show made by Guillaume Bell uh, for Witte de Wit in 1990. It was a very f the very first show, so I thought I should do it and also know Guillaume. He is a sweetheart, so <laughs> let's make him uh, <laughs> let's make him uh, um, a, a painting. And I really like the you know the um, the archive is made uh, accessible, and I like the idea that it's like you know like a like an ex libris, it's, um, there is always this uh, aspect of peripheral, peripheral um, influence, which you mustn't underestimate, um, which really works, and uh, which is very important, so I, I, uh, I really like this. And also what's important is here is um, that the attempt is to make uh, more of these um, in the following years, like later on, I, um, I want to keep on developing them and uh, sending them with the post to with it a bit or just bringing them. Um, so there's also a different temporality and a different kind of engagement. In a few years, there's a different director. So this context changes everything. Um, and I think that's very um, uh, exciting and annoying for everyone working there. <laughs> voilà. So this is a reinterpretation of the Paula Pivi exhibition they had, um, 1,000 tulkus, no, tulkus from, uh, tulkus are like, um, if I remember it correctly, are photographs of lamas from Tibet. And um, uh, these are considered holy, and uh, this is summary of uh, a show. Yeah. Um, this is the Hyun Bell um, <laughs> show. Um, uh, the show was called Für, für Garderobe Keine Haftung. I think, and um, he was uh, making lots of installations that always, uh, you know, he interpret uh, uh, or like um, imitate uh, shop window displays or these kind of things. So we had uh, like a, a washing machine shop and a light shop and a, a vitrine with like a teddy bear collection. But uh, he made very nice installations with the plants on either side. So I uh, made this, these plants on either side of the uh, thing. Then here is. Um, um, the part of the um, the Scandinavian Inst uh, Institute of Comparative Vandalism. So we uh, were allowed to reproduce some of the images. We they sent us the, the negatives, and we made uh, facsimiles, um, enlarged them, not facsimiles. We enlarged them and um, made a selection. We asked the curator of the um, uh, Museum Jorn in Silkeborg, Denmark, to um, select images because it's like oh, thousands and thousands of images uh, relating to different topics from medieval graffiti. Um, you have um, 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 uh, Celtic uh, bronze works, um, you've got uh, Baroque uh, sculptures, lots of different things. And um, we just um, couldn't make a selection. You know, it's very hard to start this. So we, so we sent instructions to the curator over there um, and he um, he made a selection according to the five themes that occurred in the history of Witte de Wit. And funny enough, and of course this is logical, um, it was very hard to find images that are related to sexuality <laughs> uh, because these don't survive. Uh, you don't think about this. Um, and also there were lots of Christian images and we are of course inclined to, uh, not of course, but we're inclined to leave it out, although it has such a big influence on what we are witnessing and doing every day. Um, so it was um, an interesting, um, uh, how do you say this, uh, uh, exercise. Um, I 
showed these images, um, I don't know if you can see it, yeah, a bit, um, on a mural. Um, and this mural is, um, I really wanted to show them in a subjective context. And this mural is um, uh, basically uh, called um, uh, um, vermiculated rustication. So rustication is a aesthetic treatment of the lower stones of the facade of a Renaissance building. This was uh, like, uh, and and before this in the Ro Roman times as well. And this was introduced in, like it was, or got popular in the Renaissance uh, because it could uh, refer to uh, be having, you know, having um, ancient Roman relationships. You know, your palace, your palazzo is built on ruins of your ancestors, you know. Um, or um, it's also, it was a very practical thing as well, but they left the stones untreated. So you could add crests and symbols and uh, like anything, or like somebody lives there, you know, your cousin becomes a poet. So you say, you know, uh, like here lived uh, poet uh, Moritz Wetzler. Mm. Well done. <laughs> and then, um, but then later on, this just became like an aesthetic finish, as you can see it in Paris. Um, where you imit where they imitate some kind of squiggly patterns. This is verm uh, vermiculated rustication. So vermiculated refers to vermiculus, which is a, a worm. So these are worm-eaten stones, and it's about deterioration and uh, these kind of things. But I thought it's in it's uh, uh, important to show um, you know uh, pieces from before the Renaissance. Um, you know, uh, photographs made of, uh, you know, uh, uh, cultural objects from before the Renaissance on a Renaissance decorative um, pattern. Uh, so that's what we, we did. And then the, out, the inside, so this is a selection of uh, uh, the beautiful uh, images we managed to obtain. It's quite something. I really uh, encourage, I, I would love you to go to the, the, the Yarn Museum in Silkeborg. It's like, um, it's in the middle of nowhere, um, in a forest, a very modest building, but a very interesting um, experience. Uh, it's quite peculiar and, uh, and beautiful. It functions in this periphery as well. And then we come to the last section. So we have the, the inserts in the archive, we have the murals, we have the Joran archive, and then there's, um, um, uh, I made three sculptures um, which are loose interpretations, or like um, you know, uh, yeah, like m more based on the on the uh, on rumors. So uh, this is a bronze plaque depicting um, the production of bronze. As you can see, you have this reference to beeswax. Um, you have uh, depictions of copper and tin, which fo forms the alloy of bronze and in the right proportions. So basically, this is a bronze referring to bronze. I made this, it's not an historical piece, I made this. Uh, it's a, a sketched into a, a plate of wax and uh, it got out of the bronze casting uh, factory like this. They cast it in sand, it comes out and they don't touch it. And that's what they call the patine du feu, the, the fire's patina. And I made this uh, because the uh, curator of the uh, Jorn Museum said, um, Joran started making bronze sculptures after he saw the black and white images of um, the Celtic bronzes and the Scythian bronzes um, in his archive. And um, this prompted him to make a, a thing like that. So I thought I should include an anecdote like this um, in this way as well. Then there's this one. Um, this is uh, a reference to Paul Tech, who had um, <coughs> And the Witte de Wit archive con has, I think, around 10 boxes of archival material related to Paul Tech, since they had a, did a, um, a retrospective of his collaborative works and his more performative works made together with the artist's co-op. Uh, one of the pieces, it's in the Museum of Luzern, and it's called the Dwarf Parade Table. And underneath the Dwarf Parade Table is a stuffed dog. And I saw an image of the stuffed dog like underneath smeared in uh, plaster and it had like uh, tits and I thought like oh he put lemons instead of tits that's so funny I, and I th so I I, uh, I thought it was a, it's a, a a detail and because of like bad photographs I, I found it and then later on we discovered this image um, in um, 
in the archive of uh, um, like a, actually it's not not property of Witte de Wit, but somebody lent it to them and they never gave it back. I think, and this is like a very personal um, uh, photo album of Paul Tech in uh, his um, you know private environment, kissing a boy and push like pushing um, uh, plastic uh, uh, tits on him. And in the background is the very dog that was uh, underneath the dwarf parade table, which would get um, uh, um, uh, lemon tits. And it says, I like sex. And uh, he's pushing these breasts on it. And later he replaces these uh, breasts, you know. And I thought this was, you know, this is such a funny coincidence. So I thought I should make it. And um, so I made this sculpture uh, to, uh, you know, this, uh, it's a reinterpretation. Again, like this is classical reference. The, the marble is called Lardo. And of course, everybody, everybody knows Paul Tech because of his uh, treatment of uh, fake meat and uh, these kind of things. And so I thought I'd uh, remake it. Now, later on, it seems I was wrong. And um, the tits, uh, the breasts were um, eggs rather than lemons. So now I made a corrected version. Uh, but this is not in the show. It's not included in the show. <laughs> So here's the other view, and like I just included a few installation shots to see like how the works interact. Then this one is also I made a piece together with Martyrum Fortune. She does very very interesting performances, and for for a performance we did a long time ago. Um, to keep it short, we uh, made a strand of pearls of six, six meters long, and um, and then later I was. Uh, reading a text like a press release of one of the shows and it said that um, Massimo Bartolini covered one room um, all the edges of one room with pearls and I thought oh, this is so beautiful and like like an enormously long strand of pearls and then I thought oh we made this we should show this so um, we just showed it there it is <laughs> all natural pearls here's another image I have one more show. So this is the show at Gladstone Gallery, which is which was quite recent. And um, it was my first show with this gallery in Brussels. And they've been in Brussels for eight years. And it's the first time they showed a Belgian artist within the Brussels branch. But I thought it was quite interesting. Uh, so I thought it was also a good time uh, to do something about the city, which is um, so specific and a bit simple. But um, so I just compiled a few anecdotes I thought were relevant to mention today in Brussels. And um, so I started with the historical part. So today, let's see, wait, I'll show you this one. The, the upper uh, image, this heart, is an abstracted uh, depiction of an iris. And um, uh, this is the logo of um, the um, um, the Brussels government, you could say. How do you say this? Gewest. It's the logo of Brussels. And uh, <laughs> um, so they, um, and this is based, uh, there's this uh, rumor, or this is um, story, that um, there used to be an invasion of um, troops of um, uh, Emperor Otto in uh, the Middle Ages. And um, they came with the cavalry to Brussels uh, and were fighting against um, the Count of Flanders and his troops. And because the Count and uh, his troops, his cavalry, they all knew uh, when you go into the swamps with your horses, you can only drive through the uh, irises because they have thick roots and always seek for a bit of sand. And um, so they knew they should stay within these uh, yellow irises. And because of this, they won the battle. All of the um, enemy's horses were getting stuck and drowning into this horrible uh, swamp. Um, whereas uh, they get a victory uh, oh, because of their botanical knowledge. As you can see, here's the horse. Um, of the adversaries. The funny thing is, this painting is incorrect because I painted the fleur de lis on this horse because I read it on a Flemish nationalist 
tourist uh, website and they said it were French um, nights and I checked it, it that it's impossible. They can't be any French invasion, inv there hasn't been a French battle, a battle with French troops in uh, the Middle Ages uh, against the Count of, uh, of uh, Brabant, so it's impossible. But um, anyway, um, I thought it was interesting to make um, a piece related to this, uh, so it seems out of the, the, the root of irises you can make a very interesting scent. I, uh, note that an acquaintance of mine is a parfumier and he told this uh, some time ago and I always remembered this, I thought it was so specific, so you let the, the roots dry for two years, then you grind them, then uh, you know you distill them and you get this very grassy, weird, violet-ish scent, which never, which is used to emphasize different scents, uh, but never plays a lead role. And I thought it's also quite uh, an interesting, you know, it's about, um, uh, you know, uh, um, the side story. Um, so that's what you see. And also in English, uh, the Iris uh, Pseudacorus is called, um, of, or in, in Dutch, the Gele Lis, is called uh, the yellow flag. So I thought that's a very nice thing to make. So you will see later on that I made uh, a yellow flag. And then this is related to um, a more um, yeah, a general topic, you could say. Uh, from time to time you see um, tractors in town uh, of farmers protesting in front of the European Union. Since uh, um, just a few weeks ago, uh, farmers were spraying milk powder on the European Parliament because the milk prices were unstable. And, uh, and uh, of course, I mean, it's very hard to be a farmer in Europe nowadays. And um, I quite understand. And this is all because of uh, globalization and uh, cheap transport. And um, uh, I thought um, you could simply state that the truck is the nemesis of the tractor. And um, the more efficient the truck drive, drives, the more difficult it gets for the tractor. And um, uh, I found, or I noticed, when you're on the road, you can tell, you know, if, if you let a, um, a truck driver, they can't see the, the outer uh, end, the backside of their, their vehicle. And when they, you let them pass by giving a small signal with your headlights, uh, they go left, right, left uh, with their indicators. And this uh, is a way of saying thank you. It means thank you. And there are like several codes like this um, in, um, in, uh, on the road. There's different lang a different language in the States and a different one here. Um, but it's, all, it's used um, quite often and quite regularly. So basically, on the opening night, um, I invited uh, a tractor. We rented a big tractor, which was stated in the park just outside of the gallery, and it was uh, speaking the language of a truck. So it was going left, right, left. Thank you, or like a danger ahead. <laughs> These kind of um, simple uh, messages. I thought so. This was relating to that, and then also another uh, issue, uh, like um, you're, you will get acquainted with, in, which happens all over the place, I suppose, um, which is this. Um, Les gamins de Bruxelles. There's a, I saw this, um, you know, uh, since uh, the attacks in Brussels, you have this uh, enormous uh, um, fascination with, um, with uh, Molenbeek. And the Flemish Telly invited um, or interviewed um, um, uh, a Moroccan mom. And uh, they asked her, like, uh, yeah, are you, are you afraid of your children? And she said, like, no, I'm a bit afraid of um, my grandchildren, and the way radicalizing and these kind of things. And I thought, like, oh, that's interesting, you know, like potentially dangerous youth. It's a very old, uh, you know, uh, theme and it's very classical. Um, and I thought it was um, interesting to mention. And the most beautiful way of um, finding this uh, duality, I thought, was uh, by depicting Krampus. And Krampus, I, I suppose you know better than I do, um, is a kind of um, half man, half beast, who is Santa's helper, like a Saint, Saint Nicholas helper, who comes down the mountain to punish and scare children and uh, to check whether they've been naughty or not. And um, I quite like that the, they have this belt with um, uh, bells, and during the year, the, the sound of a cow's bell is quite random. It's like an everyday sound, and one day a year, um, it's uh, the sound of terror. And I really like this um, um, this uh, this duality. But also, I like that uh, it's 
I always suppose it's ju uh, played by adolescents. So the first thing you do when you, you're not a child anymore is scare children. And I think that's a quite um, an, an interesting phenomenon. It's quite beautiful. That's what I dealt with. Also, you know, hey, migration again. <laughs> There's Europa. These are the pillars of Hercules again. It's exactly the same thing as uh, at Witte de Wit, Ceuta and Gibraltar. And voila. The pillars of Hercules. And of course, Hercules is known for his lion skin. That's why the button is a lion in the middle. And this is a different piece. I will be brief this time. So here's a, an image from the performance. You could see this from the window of the gallery. This park is called the Egmont Park. It was, um, this uh, was property of the Egmont family, the Counts of Egmont, I think, or the Duke, I don't know. Um, and it was confiscated after the war, uh, the Second World War, um, because they were accused of making a profit during the war and then you're collaborating. And then uh, this became uh, public uh, terrain again. And I thought this was also, an, you know, uh, uh, we always look out of the window, think of this look like it's a very luxurious location, and uh, but to think about of it as a as a as a private garden is quite uh, fascinating, I think. So to put um, a protesting tractor over there is uh, or a tractor that's contradicting itself, I thought is a nice thing to do, of Gladstone Gallery. Did it? <laughs> and then of course the the performance is just during the opening night. Um, and then uh, I thought I would leave something behind in the show, like also a temporary monument to uh, farmers or agriculture. And this is a seasonal piece, so you have to change the, its position in your home or in your uh, exhibition space according to the seasons. Because no light can hit the crystal ball because it will set the hay on fire, just like a barricade, you know, like just as protesting farmers. And uh, so um, now it's in a private collection and it has to be moved around. It can only be positioned in the northern part of the house. <laughs> you have to be rather careful. Um, but uh, so that's why it's called, also called uh, fire hazard. But this is the equivalent of the performance, I think. And also like, of course, it's seasonal and it's what, you know, what farming is about. You know, we have to take, um, uh, yeah, you know, we just had um, a good harvest this year. It was going to be very bad, and all of a sudden it became good. Did you know? I mean, it really happened. <laughs> all of a sudden it was, uh, there was enough water. Yeah. <laughs> this is, um, again, a site-specific version of the, the, the Pillars of Hercules, but then applied to existing sockles. It's very ecological. I just uh, like there was <laughs> two uh, sockles used for some sculptures. I've got no idea um, um, who used it, and uh, I just had them. I just painted them with um, the crests of uh, Ceuta and Gibraltar. Then here is um, a bell, and it's um, a bell related to Krampus. So I bought it on a website called krampusimperium.at, <laughs> which is the most horrendous website. It's beautiful. It's got this like patina. It's a patinated website. And um, they, um, they sell all kinds of knickknacks uh, in order to make your own, uh, uh, you know, uh, attire to become Krampus. And amongst others, you know, you make whips to whip children. And uh, because, you know, it's Eastern part of, you know, yeah, it's like German habits and Austrian habits, and weird. And um, <laughs> they sell this horse hair in this way. Uh, and you take it apart to make a whip, but I thought like, you know, why bother? It looks like a stick to hit somebody with, like a baton. Also bought at Campus Imperium Punct.at, and I just attached it to the wall. I thought it was ready like that. This is another view. This is the yellow flag. <laughs> Friend of mine is a fashion designer, Katrien van Hecke. She's genius. And um, she um, made this flag for me, and it's um, all silk dyed with um, curcuma, and the backside is dyed with a plant that will uh, prevent you from getting warts, <laughs> called stinkende gauwe, uh, um, chelidonium. Voila. <laughs> it also has a small logo of a sinking horse, because it relates to this uh, historical thing. And this is perfume. It's a tincture, actually, because a perfume is a combination of scents. If it's just one scent, it's tincture. And this is a tincture of um, uh, iris root. Oris root is the official name. And I thought it was um, also, you know, like to smell the root or like to smell the object that, you know, saved the, 
the Count of Brabant in the Middle Ages is quite a spectacular thing to experience. Um, and I, uh, yes, it really excites me. I'm honest about it. And then uh, I thought we should have it in the show. That's the way I showed it. <laughs> and then um, you will see all over Brussels um, these colors popping up. These are the colors of the, the city. So I just made a mural out of it. And these are like the prescriptions are uh, divide your wall in two. The top half has to be green and the lower half has to be red. And you can choose any kind of green or red. So if you want like orangish or Bordeaux with pistache, I don't mind, <laughs> which I hope will happen. <laughs> voilà. So you can see uh, there's also that link. You can see you could see the performance uh, in the park through this window. Voila. Well, I hope everything was clear. It's been quite a lot, um, but I don't think that summaries are that important in my case. Um, um, I really try to stay specific as you can tell, because then there's more, uh, there's a different w way of focusing on things or not focusing on things. It's about a certain kind of attention and um, um, the pieces get autonomy by staying so specific, I think. If you get very ambitious and, uh, uh, and try to make a um, yeah, conclusion, um, it closes down and, uh, and uh, you know, melts. And um, I don't want to do that. Uh, so that's why I just talk a lot and uh, tell everything. <laughs> and there you go. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much.